I get a telephone from my daughter, uh, Linda, my oldest daughter. I have two daughters. They're a year apart. Cindy lives down in Southern California. L Linda lives in uh, Seaside. She's married to Michael Pangrazio. Michael used to work for uh, George Lucas and Spielberg, you know, in all those movies, Star Wars, Indiana Jones. He's a famous in the film community and uh, television for his art skills. Got two Emmys for his television work, and they have given me two grandchildren. Nathaniel is uh, 12 and a half, Natalie's 11. And I've got pictures, in case you want to <laughs> No. Anyway, one day, uh, my daughter Linda calls me on the phone. Says, hi, Dad. I said, hi, Linda. She said, just a moment. And it sounded like she put the phone down on the table. And I heard this clapping. And she picked up the phone and said, Daddy, did you hear that? And I said, yes. She said, that's in case you haven't gotten any applause lately. <laughs> So when I talk to Linda tomorrow, in fact, I'm going to go see the kids on Monday, I'll say uh, she doesn't need to clap for me on the phone, right? I got plenty of applause in uh, Santa Clara. Anyway, let's go back to work. I never thought in my wildest imagination that I would ever be able to have something to say for two whole days. I mean, it just, it's, I'm amazed. I'm, I'm still amazed. At what happens. In fact, I was so excited to get here today to hear what I have to say, right? It's just amazing. So let's talk now about the subject that uh, exploded my life into change. I've never been the same, and that's uh, personal development. It's um, a subject I came in contact with when I was 25 years old. I, I was raised in southwest Idaho. I, I still have the old family farm. My papa's gone. He was 93. Mama's gone. She was uh, 79, so it looks like I'm going to be around a long time. Good genes. My papa never retired. When he died, his paycheck was waiting for him. That's pretty good, right? So um, I intend to be around a long, long time, looks like. But anyway, I was raised in southwest Idaho and still have the old family farm, you know, raising the normal crops in that part of the world. And my neighbor raises Arabian horses, and I furnish clover sometimes for him. And some years it's potatoes, and some years it's winter wheat, and some years it's something else. And also got vineyards. Got a new wine label, just finishing up. Roan Bittner, Dr. Bittner's my partner. Roan Bittner Vineyards, the Chardonnay of last year was absolutely incredible. But I, you know, went to college one year. And uh, halfway through my second year, I quit, unfortunately age 19. I uh, should have stayed in school, right? But I thought, hey, I'm smart enough to get a job. How much smarter do you need to be? So with that kind of shallow thinking back then, you know, I quit school and went to work. A little later, got married, started a little family, and, you know, sort of struggled along in the sor sort of average American uh, family, just young, getting started. And uh, age 25, you know, I'm behind on my obligations, creditors calling once in a while, and I'm embarrassed by being in that position, very short on my promises to my family, not feeling good about myself, and then I had a chance to meet this extraordinary man by the name of Mr. Schof, Mr. Earl Schof, and a lot of you have already heard that part of my story. A friend of mine had gone to work for him, and he said, you've got to meet this man. He's rich, but he's easy to talk to. And he's got a remarkable philosophy of life and business. So I thought, well, I've got to meet this guy. Had a chance to meet him. Long story short, he invited me to participate in his company. And I was with him for uh, five years before he died. And he died at the early age of 49. But during that five years, I learned these revolutionary things. My parents laid a great foundation for me uh, all those years, which has lasted me all of my life. But to open up business and to open up the world and open up opportunity uh, that I could qualify for started with this uh, man by the name of Mr. Schof, Mr. Earl Schof. And here's one of the early subjects he taught me called personal development. And it's, I've illustrated it in so many ways, but one of the best is when you're teaching kids financial independence. 
When I teach kids financial independence, here's what I teach. We get paid for bringing value to the marketplace. But this will also serve as an introduction to personal development. We get paid for bringing value to the marketplace. The key is to study the marketplace. Tomorrow we may talk about what I taught in Moscow. Profits are better than wages. Capitalism at the grassroots is the vitality of the nation. So you study your marketplace. Now the key is to bring value to the marketplace. Now, up here put time. It takes time to bring value to the mar marketplace. Actually, there's two parts to the value. To bring a product or a service and to be valuable to the marketplace. To bring value and to be valuable. And it takes time, but we don't get paid for the time. We get paid for the value. So the key is to study the marketplace. What do they need? What could I bring? And what could I become? Management, leadership, whatever. So could I find something valuable to bring to the marketplace? And could I be valuable to the marketplace? That is the key. Study the marketplace. But then my mentor said the main thing is to study yourself. And then when I teach economics to kids, I teach. America's ladder to climb starts down here at $5 an hour, and this ladder starts going up like this. Top income last year, there's a whole variety of stories. I'm sure one of the top was something like $26 million, something like that, for one year. So we started $5 an hour, and we go up to $26 million. Now, here's what we call this, a heck of a ladder not much better way to describe it, right? That's a heck of a ladder. So here's what everybody has the opportunity to climb the ladder. Now, first, all you need is what? A chance. That's all everybody needs is a chance and a start and now education as to how to take advantage of your chance, how to get started, and use your education to move up this ladder, speaking financially. Now, there's a lot of ways to grow, but speaking financially... This is the deal. So let's say you start at $5 an hour. And really, who cares uh, where you start as long as you, they let you on the ladder. So you start at $5 an hour. Now the first key is, how do you increase the $5? And there's several philosophies to increasing the $5. Here's number one. Uh, wait for them to raise the minimum wage. Right? Wouldn't that be one philosophy? Now, the last time it took how many years? Right? Several years to raise the minimum wage, which is okay. I'm not saying it isn't okay. It's one way to get an increase in uh, income is to wait for the minimum wage. Okay, here's the next philosophy, to wait for a raise, which is certainly legitimate. But now the question is, how often do the raises come? Every six months, maybe, one year, they do what? A review? What if you miss the review? Well, you've got to wait another six months or maybe a year. So that might take quite a while to go from five, let's say, to six. Here's another philosophy. Go on strike. <laughs> Here's the philosophy we call uh, by demand, to demand more. And if you don't give me more, I'll go on strike. I won't work, which is one philosophy. To get more by demand. Now, here's the problem with demand. Make the note. Kids need to learn it. You can't get rich by demand. You might get a few more pennies, right? You might get an extra dollar. You might get an extra benefit or something, but you can't get rich by demand. Here's why. Not that it isn't America, and not that it isn't that economically now we're doing incredibly well, but here's why you can't get rich by demand. It's the wrong philosophy. And here's what would be tragic all your working life, to live in the right country and have the wrong philosophy. So you can't get rich by demand. Then how could you get rich in America? It's very simple. Change your philosophy. And what would be the new philosophy? Answer. You get rich by performance, not by demand. 
Now, my mentor says, some people don't just make $5 an hour. They've moved up to 6 How easy would it be to get to 6 Probably pretty easy. If you work for McDonald's, they paid you $5 an hour hauling out the trash. If you whistle while you haul out the trash, they'll pay you $6 an hour. Right? Here's an unusual person. They deserve $6 just because of their attitude. Wear the hat, say yay, McDonald's. Okay? So for that, you get an extra, what, dollar an hour because the company recognizes it. Hey, looks like this is going to be an oncoming person. So it's not that difficult to go from five to six. But here's what's interesting. Some earn $50 an hour, 10 times as much. How could you multiply your income by 10? One, you probably couldn't do it waiting for a raise. Certainly you couldn't do it waiting for them to change the minimum wage. And you certainly couldn't do it by demand. Because usually when they make demands, they don't demand that you multiply my income by 10. People don't go on strike for multiplying their income by 10, usually, right? It's just a little increase. So how could you go from 5 to 10? Interesting. But that's not the end of it. Can you think of somebody that makes $500 an hour? My Beverly Hills attorney, yes. I think. And you can think of some, right, that make $500 an hour. Now, 500 multiplies by 10 again. Not just once from $5 to 50, but from 50 to 500 is multiplying by 10 again. Can you multiply by 10 and then multiply by 10? And the answer is yes. One, living in the right country is an advantage. But here's the greatest advantage, having the right philosophy. Now, $500 an hour is not the end of the story. We go right on up to these top incomes. Would a company pay someone $26 million for one year's work? And the answer is yes. They do it all the time, right? Not because this guy went on strike. <laughs> for the, that's not how he gets the $26 million. So... A change and a shift in philosophy here starts to change everything. Now, my mentor said, you can climb this ladder, Mr. Rohn, as high as you wish to climb it. And we're just talking economics now. There's a lot of other values to go for. But speaking economically, you can climb this ladder as high as you wish to climb it if you'll follow this philosophy. And here's what he said. You, you that have been around for a while have heard me say it. He said, learn to work harder on yourself than you do on your job. Learn to work harder on yourself than you do on your job. I got the message, age 25. Then he added, if you work hard on your job, you can make a living, which is noble. If you work hard on yourself, you could make a fortune, which is exciting. I had never heard that kind of philosophy before. Working harder on yourself than you do on your job. Work hard on your job, make a living, which is fine. Work hard on yourself, make a fortune, which is super fun. Or working hard on yourself starts to multiply your value to the marketplace. So we're talking about bringing value and being valuable to the marketplace. And this is the key. We don't get paid for the time. We get paid for the, for the value. Then he put it in the form of a philosophy that I've been teaching now all these years, which is so important. And now let me give you that philosophy. He said, success is something you attract by the person you become. Success is something you attract by the person you become. Success is not something you pursue. Chase, run after. Success is something you develop, something you become. You attract success. Tomorrow we're going to talk leadership. Here's the theme of leadership. To attract attractive people, you must be attractive. To attract skillful people, you must be skillful. To attract committed people, you must be committed. So the whole key to unlock all the treasures, whether it's economic treasures or spiritual treasures, financial, social, personal, every way you can possibly think of is by your own personal development. And then he added one more, which is so important, and it's probably worth the price of the seminar. Here it is. What you become is much more valuable than what you get. 
What you become is much more valuable than what you get. The major question to ask on the job is not what am I getting here. The major question to ask on the job is what am I becoming here? Not what am I getting, what am I becoming? So it's very important what you become because what you become attracts. If you become cynical, you attract cynicism. What you become attracts. So this whole subject of personal development was so vitally important to me. It changed my life. I was a millionaire by age 31, and that was just the economic part of it. It took me six years from age 25 to age 31. It was unbelievable. So right country, but a refinement of philosophy is what's important. So let's now talk about personal development. The first subject is called The Seasons. An understanding of the seasons to illustrate the total aspect of life. One of the best ways to illustrate for your children or for anyone, life situations, is to use the illustration of the seasons. So let's go through it. Here they are, the seasons. Number one, you cannot change the seasons until you get your own planet. You can't change the seasons. They're set. All of this has been set in motion. But here's the next piece of information. You can change yourself. You can't change the seasons, but you can change yourself. Life and business is like the changing seasons. Frank Sinatra saying, life is like the seasons. So now let's quickly go through the seasons. This is a whole study in itself. But I can just give you a little outline here, some ideas, and you can take it from there and and use it in whatever manner that would serve you, as well as to serve your own understanding of, of time, the passing of time. First, learn how to survive the winter. Speaking of life in its simplest aspect, the first key to learn in your life on the spinning planet is to learn how to survive. Now, there's all kinds of winters, right? The winter of the calendar, right? The winter of the actual season. But then there's financial winters and social winters, personal winters. But we understand those because we've all been through them. Barbara Streisand sings, it used to be so natural to talk about forever, but used to be's don't count anymore. They just lay on the floor till we sweep them away. You don't sing me love songs. You don't say you need me, and you don't bring me flowers anymore. A winter song. But we know what those lyrics are about. You know, we've been through those experiences. The winters. Now, here's the key on the winters. Some are long, and some are short. Some are easy, and some are tough. But they always come right after harvest right after fall, autumn. So we cannot rearrange the coming of the winters, but here's what we could do. Get stronger, wiser, and better so that we can survive better. And our life will be less eroded by learning to handle the next winter, the next winter of a divorce, the next winter of an illness, the next winter of a death in the family the next winter of a loss financially, the next winter of a a crisis of whatever kind, to be better equipped. So here's the key to learn the seasons so that you can approach it all in a very intelligent way. For kids, we teach the ant philosophy. The ant philosophy. So for the kids that aren't here, take this home. For the kids that aren't here, the ant philosophy. And here's the little short list on the ant philosophy. Number one, ants never quit. If an ant is headed somewhere and you stop him, he'll start looking for another way. How long will he look? Till he finds it or till he dies. One way or the other, he'll find it. Okay. So that's a good philosophy. Just never quit like an ant. Here's the next part of the ant philosophy. Ants think winter all summer. 
You've got to think negative when it's positive. And not be disillusioned. That's why ants always seem to be in a hurry. Why are they in a hurry? Because they're thinking winter, 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 hurry, hurry, hurry. Get going, go, 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 go. So you must think negative when it's positive. You must think winter when it's summer. Here's some of the best advice. It comes from classic tradition. A great story says, don't build your house on the sand in the summer. Why? be given that advice, because it's easy to get faked out in the summer, right? Blue sky, fleecy clouds, nice weather, so you build your house on the sand. You say, no, you must not be faked out when it's nice. You must think storm in the summer and not get faked out. And if you think storm, now you'll look for a rock on which to build your house. Now you're going to be safe. So you can't think nice when it's nice. You've got to think storm when it's nice. And if you haven't been through one of those storms, you've got to find somebody and say, have you been through one of those storms? Scare me to death, if you will, please, so I can. <laughs> so I will not be faked out here, and I will keep searching, right? Not to quickly build on the sand because it's nice, but to build on a rock because it's not always going to be like this. The seasons are going to come and change. And if you're not educated to that degree, now you suffer a great loss. So the ant thinks winter in the summer. Now, here's the next philosophy. I'm sure the ant thinks summer in the winter. The time to think positive is when it's negative. Why? Because the negative won't last long. How long is the winter? Isn't that long? So the ant thinks summer in the winter. This won't last long. We'll soon be out of here. Just hang on. It's not going to take that long. How long is the night? It's only a few hours. Come on. There's never been a double night. Couldn't you make it a a few more hours? And the story says, yes, the the night just can't last. For Sometimes it seems like it's going to last forever. And when you have insomnia, right, it seems like the night will never pass. But I'm telling you, sure enough, it will pass. So learn to think day when it's night. And then you must learn to think night when it's day. An old prophet said, work while it's day. Work, work while it's day because the night's coming. Right? This was before Thomas Edison. And the light, you've got to work when it's day because the night comes when you can't work. Of course, now we can work day and night. But back then, you couldn't work when the night came. So you had to get it going, get it in before the night came. So this is a good idea now. Learn to think negative when it's positive. Learn to think storm when there is no storm. Learn to think winter in the summer. But then we must learn to think summer in the winter. We can make it through a few more hours, right? A few more days. It won't be that long. Hang in here. The spring will surely come. Okay. So the winters of life, learn to express those to other people. Help them understand that as well as to try to understand it yourself. Now here's the next season, the spring. Spring is called opportunity. Not a guarantee. It's guaranteed the spring will come, but it's not a guarantee of a harvest. Here's the key. You must do something with the spring. Take advantage of the spring. Read every book you can get your hands on what to do with the springs of your life. Take advantage of the day because the day follows the night. It's an opportunity now to turn things around. It's an opportunity to have a better one than than the last one. It's an opportunity for a new beginning, a new spring, a new day, a new beginning. In business, we learn to create an artificial spring because in an industrialized society, right, it seems like, you know, the seasons just don't mean that much. You know, when you're a farmer out there, they mean everything. But when you're not working on the line, you know, whatever. So sometimes you've got to create an artificial spring. We're going to take the next 90 days and we're really going to pour it on. Like if you're in sales, the next 90 days, I'm going to make every contact possible. You just create an artificial spring next 30 days, next 90 days. Right? Bargain with your family. Say, look, I know we were going to do some things the next 90 days, but if you'll postpone those for me, I'll really pay back because I want to use this now as a springtime to go for it, go for it, go for it. So spring is the, is the chance to take advantage of a, another opportunity. The day follows the night. It is a promise, but you must take advantage, do something with it. 
Now, here's what you must do in the spring. It's a very short season usually. You must hurry. You wouldn't ask a farmer to go bowling in the spring. He hasn't got time. Why? The season is too short. The planting season is too short. You've got to get it done fairly quickly. And life at its longest is short. The Beatles wrote, life is very short. Which is true. My father lived to be 93, but it seemed to be very short. It didn't seem that long. So life is short. For um, John Lennon, it was extra short. For Michael Landon, life was extra short. For my mentor, died at age 49, that's extra short. But life at the longest is short. So you must learn to appreciate opportunity and take advantage of it while it's day, while it's time. Now, we call spring a window of opportunity. If you have a chance to talk to someone, the window's open. It may not stay open very long, so take advantage. Don't hesitate. Meet a new friend. Talk to somebody while the window's open. Now, here's the season for everybody to understand because it is so applicable to our life, and that's the season of summer. Two things we must do in the summer, nourish our values and protect. Nourish like a mother, protect like a father. The twin challenges in the summertime help to illustrate life, that we are confronted with both good and evil. Is that the way it should be? You've got to ask somebody a little higher up than me. We could get into a, probably a pretty great debate. Would there be good without evil? Here's the best, best answer I've got in our finite position at the moment. Here's the best answer. It doesn't seem like it. It seems like it takes the contrast to make a scenario, to make an adventure. Now, remember, we didn't set it up. So, But here, here's what seems to be the setup. Opposites in conflict. That seems to be the setup for a human adventure. One contesting against the other, vying for the territory. Would there be light without darkness? We probably wouldn't call it light. What gives us the value of one is the contrast of the other. But darkness is always trying to move in and take all the territory. But if you turn on the light... Its energy starts to repel darkness. Darkness begins to move away, move away. And the, the brighter the light, the further away the darkness must move. If you walk into a dark room and turn on the light, the darkness is what? Gone. But here's the point to remember. Not very far. The darkness seems to be, yes, it's gone, but it, it's waiting. Waiting for its chance that if energy, light loses its energy, darkness has a chance not to move back in. Here's one of the, the better realistic illustrations, and that's health and illness at odds in your body. Illness trying its best to drive health into a small corner and occupy the territory. And health trying what? To push illness into a small corner. There's this contest going on. Who's going to occupy the territory? If one stays strong, the other is diminished. If the other gains in power then the other is diminished. Okay. So what you must learn to do is cooperate with the positive side of everything in your body and your life. Sometimes we sabotage our own best interest. The body needs a banana, you send it a Coca-Cola. And the body says, what is the deal here? I'm, I'm health trying to drive illness into a small corner. I ordered a banana, you send me a Coca-Cola. So the body could rightfully say what? Whose side are you on? Give us a break here. We need every tool we can get to keep illness at bay. Because if we get weak, I'm telling you, it moves in, moves in, moves in, takes the territory. So we're in the middle of this contest. And here's what it's called, opposites in conflict. Here's one of the bigger conflicts, liberty and tyranny. Liberty is the absence of tyranny. But even though tyranny is, is conquered, it, it's not very far away. The same goes on in your bloodstream. Red corpuscles to nourish like a mother and give life. White corpuscles to fight and kill like a father. White corpuscles say, just show me some infection, I'll kill it. 
If I don't kill it, what? It killed you. Somebody's going to get killed <laughs> in this contest, right? Good, evil, liberty, tyranny, right? Health, illness, winning and losing, right? There's, a, there's the struggle going on. But here's the key. It's the only way, it seems, it's the only way to create a human adventure. There doesn't seem to be any other way currently, currently. Now, some speak of a new heaven and a new earth, and maybe the whole arrangement will be different. Could very well be. But in this current experience, it seems like to create an adventure, to create a unique human scenario, we need opposites in conflict. And that's the deal. Thank God for white corpuscles that think negative all day. Tyranny and liberty. Saddam Hussein takes over Kuwait. What should we do? Somebody says, well, Kuwait, what do we care? Well, what if next he wants uh, Saudi Arabia? You say, well, it's a pile of sand. What do we care? Well, what if next he wants Israel? You say, well, little Israel, what do we care? Well, what if next he wants the rest of the Mediterranean? You say, well, yes, I guess we've got to draw a line somewhere. Yes, somewhere. You've always got to draw a line somewhere and tell illness, hey, you can't have any more. You've got to throw up the barriers, draw a line in the sand. Our president, George Bush, was right to draw a line in the sand, put together the coalition and put together a half a million troops and go kick Saddam Hussein out of Kuwait. History demanded it. Hired Chief White Corpuscle General Schwarzkopf. <laughs> I met the general a couple of times. He was the man to send. <laughs> so, liberty and tyranny in a contest. And it's the only way to have a civilized society. Tyranny cannot be rehabilitated. Tyranny can only be restrained. So for Saddam Hussein, we put a no-fly zone on top and a no-fly zone on the bottom. Right, to contain so that liberty would have a chance, the citizens of the world would have a chance, that the world would have a better chance. And we've got to fight these skirmishes. We've been fighting them forever. We've got to fight them forever. Whether they're inside your own body or whether they're in politics, no matter where they are, we must play this game. We must fight this game. But here's what it creates, a great adventure. Let me give you the ultimate now. Could you win if you couldn't lose? And the answer is no, it doesn't seem like it. You, you couldn't call it winning. You can't win if you couldn't lose. So that's the deal now. Negative, positive. Would there be negative, uh, positive without negative? No, it doesn't seem like it. It seems like this is the current setup, you know, for the foreseeable future. It looks like it's been that way as long as we can remember and as long as the history tells us. So here's what you want to do if you want the adventure. You must learn to play this game, to work with all the positive forces to defeat the negative forces as early and as soon and as much as possible, to contain the ravages of disease that want to take you early. You've got to fight back. You can't just leave it. Somebody says, well, I've got my fingers crossed. Not a good philosophy. <laughs> you've got to take your vitamins. You've got to do the stuff. You've got to do the deal. Jump on the positive side of whatever you want and see if you can't help out in this warfare and this push-shove match. That's the key. So in the summer, here's what you must do. Nourish the plants and the garden. Nourish your values like a mother. Give life. Whatever you start now, you must nourish it and give it life. Don't neglect a new life if you've started a new life. What if you said to a brand new mother, where is your baby? She says, I have no idea. You would say, no, that isn't right. If you start a new life, you must care for it. You must protect it. You must give it life, give it nourishment. Now, here's the other part. You must protect it like a father. That's why the old wise man said, we must learn to love and hate. So underline that. You must learn to love and hate. And the illustration he used was, you must learn to love good and hate evil. To deal with the weeds in your garden, you've got to hate weeds. You've got to hate them enough to what? Kill them. You can't say, well, poor weeds. Say, no, this ain't the deal, poor weeds. Don't go soft on this stuff now. 
You've got to hate evil. You've got to hate the weeds that are out to destroy your garden and rob your children of the nourishment they deserve. So here's the deal. Love like a mother, hate like a father. And here's the rest of it. Give life like a mother and take life like a father. You've got to take the life of the weeds or they will take the life of your garden. Somebody's going to get killed. <laughs> Remember? So you must be like a father. Any father would say to whatever threatens his family, take three more steps toward this family, you'll cease to exist. I'm father. I kill. So send out the warnings. Send out the signals. Both mother and father reside here. Mother nourishes and father gives protection. And yes, it's possible to love like a father and hate like a mother, just so you get both done. In fact, nothing more dangerous than an angry mother, especially in the animal kingdom. Mess with mama bear's cubs. If you're a threat to her cubs, she'll kill you. That's that female mother instinct. Kill first, talk later. <laughs> okay, you got that now? It's good advice. We're going to learn in communication shortly. You've got to learn to put love and hate in the same sentence because it's vitally important. Sometimes you must say to your children, what? I love you, but I hate what's going on. They've got to know what you love and what you hate. You don't hate them, but you hate what's going on. You hate the dangers. So learn the good evil. Summer time. Now here's the greatest battle in the mind. Here's what you must not become in the summer in your mind, a victim of yourself. What is that insidious voice inside your own head that says, you're too short, it'll never work for you, you're too tall, right? It's over for you, right? It's never worked for you before. What gives you any idea that it'll work for you now? You've never been able to rise up and take charge of your life. What makes you think you can do it now? There's going to be too many obstacles out there. You'll never overcome them all. What is that insidious voice? It's the same game going on inside your head that's going on in the world. Liberty and tyranny in a push-shove match. And here's what you've got to do. Cooperate with the positive side of your life and let faith drive out doubt. Right? Let winning drive out losing. Let positive drive out negative. But you've got to get into the contest. And why get into the contest? Because that's how you create an adventure. There is no other way. It takes both. You've got to learn to laugh, yes, but that's not what the wise men only said. You can't just learn to laugh and keep on laughing. No, that's silly. It says there's also a time to cry. You've got to learn to both laugh and cry. Then it said you must be so sophisticated as not to laugh when it's time to cry. Then it further says you must learn to laugh with those that laugh and learn to cry with those that cry. That now gives you an understanding of what life is all about. Sadness and joy, the contest, the difference, and yet it creates the adventure. What if you went to listen to the symphony orchestra and the symphony only played little happy high notes all evening, just little pleasant happy high notes? How much of that could you take? <laughs> Say, no, don't you want to hear the crash of the cymbals that scares you to death? Don't you want to hear the, the minor key of the music that shows you the tragedy as well as the triumph? And the answer is, yes, play me the whole orchestra. I can handle it. Because that's what life is all about. Positive, negative. What if the minister only prayed happy prayers every Sunday? How much of that could you take? Happy, happy, every Sunday, every Sunday, happy, happy. How much, how much could you take? Who's going to pray angry prayers? Who's going to pray frustrated prayers? Who's going to weep in public for the lost children? It takes both. You've got to weep with those that weep and Laugh with those that laugh. You've got to have this full understanding of the game. You've got to understand the highs and the lows, the tragedy and the triumph. Most of the music of the world is written in the minor key, the key of pathos and sadness and mystery and wonder. You can't eliminate that from your life. It takes both to create an adventure. But here's the adventure to overcome the evil, to put evil in its place, just like in your mind, you've got to stand guard at the door of your mind and see if you can't suppress, see if you can't do battle with the negative forces. 
Don't become a victim of yourself. Beware of the thief on the street that's after your purse. But also beware of the thief in your mind that's after your promise. And see if you can't engage in this mental contest and win the day. That's the summer. Now here's one more season. And that's the season of harvest. Here's the key to remember harvest time. In due season, in due time, when it's time. And part of this is to develop the patience so that when it's time, it will come. But you cannot be impatient. Patience is part of the game here. You can't plant the seed and two, three days later dig around and say, where's my crop, where's my crop? Say, no, come on, that's foolish. We'll take you away to some safe place. This, you got to plant and what? You got to plant and wait and exercise patience. And then when it comes time, you give it nourishment and you give it care and you give it protection. And then you got to wait some more and you got to wait some more and you got to wait some more. But here's what it says. In due time, in due season, when it's ready, when it's time for you, whatever it is, financially, socially, personally, economically, whatever the time, when it's time, your harvest will come. The old wise man said what? Run the race. And the prize will be yours if you don't faint. And sometimes in the summer, it's easy when the sun is hot to faint, to spend less time. But if you faint not, if you're there ready after this activity of summer, do the summer work. Just make the little note. Do the work of summer, nourishing protecting, whether it's family, whether it's business, the work of summer. Now, the harvest. Here's the key now to harvest, to wisely use the resources. When your harvest comes now, you can't blow it all. You can't spend it all. You can't live it all up. Remember the two parts to life. One, the full development of all your potential. Second, the wise use of all your resources. Tomorrow, one of our major subjects is going to be the management of time, time management. If we have time, we'll go through that. <laughs> it was said, I'm going to cover procrastination, but I've decided to put that off till tomorrow. <laughs> the management now of your resources when they come. An ancient story says they took the seven years of plenty and they didn't live it all Make the note. You must take the seven years of plenty and not live it all up. What did they do? They used the seven years of plenty to get ready for the next seven years of famine. The first seven to prepare for the next seven. We'll talk more about that tomorrow under financial independence. So the subject of the seasons, so vital, so important. Such a great illustration to almost every life situation you can think of. It'll help your kids. It'll help your business. It'll help your management people, your sales people, everybody. This could be one of our best seasons in terms of the world. The turning of the century. Everybody's thinking about the year 2000. A new century, a new millennium, a new beginning, a new chance, a new opportunity for world cooperation, national, international cooperation, what can we do to play our small part in the whole wide-ranging scheme of things? It's good that everybody's thinking about this. This could be a new time, a new chance, a new opportunity. Right? <laughs> yes, we've blown it in the past. And we've messed it up in the past. But maybe, just maybe this time, there's enough technology and enough sanity and enough spirit and enough righteousness and enough rightness, enough stuff to make this the opening years of the next centuries, some of the most promising years in the last 6,000. Wow. Now make these quick notes and we're going to take a break. The four steps to success. These personal development subjects are just vitally important. The first step to success is good ideas. You must be a collector of good ideas. 
Here's where my mentor did me the greatest of service, and that was keeping a journal of good ideas. Here's what he said. Don't trust your memory. What classic information. Don't trust your memory. If a good idea comes, jot it down. One, so you can review it. Two, so that you capture it. It won't be lost. So all those years back then, I started keeping a journal. I got journals you wouldn't believe. Little cheap ones when I first started. Those, remember the Greg shorthand? Little books, little spiral things? I, I used those. You could say, you must be broke. Yes, you know, I wasn't doing very well, so it cost, I don't know, a quarter or something back then. Now my journals are expensive. <laughs> this one cost $42. And I wished it would have cost more because I'm doing really well. <laughs> <laughs> my journals. But uh, if you look at all my journals, you can tell how my life was going. Say he was poor here, and it looks like he was rich here, and then he was broke again, and now it looks like he's rich again for sure. So, but here's the key, and we'll talk about this more also under time management, something to pass on to the next generation, the collection of ideas that made you healthy, the collection of ideas that turned your life around, the collection of ideas that uh, caused you to learn extra skills and got the extra income. The wise use of your resources, the ideas you found on how to do that. Think of passing this on now to the next generation and the next generation. This is so valuable, but mostly now primarily for your own study, so you can go back over what you've collected. And in a now different place, same ideas, but now that you're in a different place, you'll see it in a whole new light on how it will help change your business, help change your career, your future, relationships, and all the rest. Keeping a journal. Right Now, this is for serious students. Non-serious students don't need to keep a journal. Right? But for serious students that are serious about their health and serious about their future, serious about gathering things to make a contribution to others, keeping a journal. That's important. A collection of good ideas, first step to success. Here's the next step, a good plan. You've got to have a good plan. You've got to have a good health plan. My mentor asked me when I'm 25, Mr. Owen, what's your current plan for your financial future? And I said, I don't have one, right? And that was obvious. He said, you got to create a plan, a good financial plan. If we finish the seminar tomorrow and, and you lingered a while and gave me the details of your current financial plan for the future, would I get so excited about it, I'd go across the country and lecture on it? And you say, no, Mr. Owen, you probably wouldn't want to lecture on my plan. And my next question would be what? Why not? Have you reached this point in your life's maturity and you don't have a plan that's got you up early and keeping you up late that you're excited about unfolding? We're going to talk more about this tomorrow under Financial Independent. Here's one of the first things you must do if you're a parent. Build a financial wall around your family nothing can get through. Build a financial wall around your family nothing can get through. Now, there's other protections that a parent must engage in. But here's one of the first ones, since it's so possible living in America. A financial wall around your family nothing can get through. Got to have a good health plan. You know, you can't be out of breath after the year 2000. You got to have the vitality, right? You got to have the breath. You got to have the vitality. So you got to have a good health plan. You got to have a good financial plan. You've got to have a good plan for your goals and plans and dreams, and we're going to get into our workshop tomorrow. We'll go through all of that. So number one is good ideas. Number two is good plans. Here's two more, and we'll come back from our break and, and give a little more detail on these. Here's number three, learning to handle the passing of time. That's one of the big challenges in everybody's life, learning to handle the passing of time. And then here's number four, the solving of problems. And that's what life is all about, taking them on, finding solutions, executing, recording progress.